I believe intuition is uncomfortably misunderstood. I believe that A students and very narrow, uh, kind of rigid thinkers, which most people are, have demonized intuition. I think intuition is looked upon as careless and is positioned as silly or flaky or whatever else you want to call it. And I will tell you that it is basically something that I've started exploring with myself and I believe it is a category of information that I will talk a lot more about because basically everything good that I've decided that has gone on to be very, very good has been far more based on intuition than anything else. I get a lot of questions from listeners who, because of the things that have happened in their past, yeah. they don't know how to trust their intuition. Yeah. And I get a lot of questions about decision making and how to truly, in a situation like this, where you are burning through your entire life savings, yeah. you have left your dream job, you have gotten no after no after no after no after no. How do you stay connected to your intuition in a situation like that? Mm -hmm. what, what tool do you have or what advice can you give to somebody who's having trouble hearing what the right decision is mm -hmm. in that kind of situation? Yeah. So I think that intuition is like a muscle that we build mm -hmm. um, over time. And I think it's a lifelong journey that, you know, to really learning how to hear it and to trust it. And one of the greatest tools, I think, is to uh, go back, think back to times in your life where maybe you had this gut feeling to do something and everyone around you said, don't do it. So you listen to them. You didn't trust yourself. And then think about what happened. Right. And then similarly, go back to a time where everyone was like, oh, uh, uh, no way, no way. And you're like, but I love him. I don't think he's lying. I think his <laughs> phone really did break five times every weekend. He didn't disappear his phone. Like, right. Think about like that situation when everyone was telling you something and 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 you didn't listen or even your gut was telling you right and you didn't listen and you think back to those times and you start to develop pattern recognition mm. um of how it felt in moments in your life when you trusted yourself or didn't and what happened and you get better attuned to what that feels like so what does it feel like for you I in both situations like can you describe what it feels like for you when you're like yep no that's a no Yes. And what does it feel like for you when you're like, I'm sticking with this? Yeah. Often it's the tiniest of feelings in my gut, right? Some people describe it as like a still small voice. I pray about it. I ask God to give me the answers and I try to live the answers. Do you feel the answers that God gives you? Like, is that what happens for you when you do this? Like right now when I look at you, right? Yeah. Like I know you're a beautiful soul, right? I just know it. You know it. You feel it. Like I feel like you have good, like you're good. You know what I mean? It's a yeah. feeling, right? And, and we get these feelings, but so much around us is so loud, mm. you know? And we just learn over time. And by the way, not to go, this could be a whole other episode, but especially as women from the time we're young, we learn not to trust ourselves. We, we, we walk in to our parents fighting and we go, is everything okay? They're like, everything's great. Everything is great, right? To protect us, we start to learn to You're doubt like, ourselves, baloney. right? Yep. But uh -huh. you know, or, you know, especially as young girls, you learn to make decisions by consensus mm. often with your friends. And or you, making other people happy. Making other people happy. Uh, people pleasing. We're rewarded for, for, for pleasing everyone else and, and almost ignoring what we feel. So, so if you're someone who's an adult right now going, I don't even know how to hear my own gut or trust myself. That's why <laughs> we've been trained out of learning how to do it, right? So it takes intentionality and really um, deciding, oh, you know what? I'm going to put in some time, even if it's five minutes a day, just to thinking about moments in my life where I trusted myself or I didn't. Um, and if you don't remember any of them, start now. You know what you just inspired me to think about? Hmm. I don't even know if it's possible to do this, but imagine if you could go through the rest of today and only make decisions that align with what you truly want. 
If you don't want to go to that party tonight, don't go. If a friend asks you something and you feel obligated out of guilt to lend them that thing, don't actually lend them the thing. Eat what you want to eat tonight for dinner. Don't just go to wherever your friends want to go. Like, I think that would be a real eye-opening experiment if you were to do that. And you start building that muscle, right? And the more you do that, some some people don't even pay attention to what they actually want to eat for dinner. They're just like, what sounds good to everyone? But to your point, when you start paying mm-hmm. attention, then you also start building that knowing of hearing your own knowing. Do you think it's possible to discover your unique purpose in life if you are not connected and listening to your intention? And in, intuition, I mean. And your own intuition. Here's how I think it's, I think it's way more likely and, and, and you're going to actually discover more than one purpose often Mm. if you're really tuned in to your intuition and, and, and you're intentional about it. But what I'll say for someone who feels like they can't hear their gut, but they still want to find their purpose. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Rory Vaden says that your, your, your best position to serve the person you once were right? Um, uh, Trent Shelton, our friend, says says one day the things you're going through right now will be the things you made it through. Yeah. And what I would say to someone listening right now is look at something in the past that has broken your heart, that has caused you grief, that has been something uh, that you care deeply about, whether it's mm-hmm. positive or negative, that you've gone through, something you care deeply about, um, or maybe pain you've gone through, something you have made it through. I believe often when we go through the hardest times in our life, yep. it's for one of two reasons. What are they? It is to either equip us with the strength we need to carry the weight of our success that's to come, mm. to carry the weight of our purpose that's to come, or we've gone through these horrible, unspeakable times, things we would never want to happen to us again in our life because we're actually going to get our greatest source of fulfillment and purpose by one day helping someone else who's going through them. And I love that saying that you're best equipped to help the person you used to be. Yes, yes, yes. So let's go to that moment, Jamie. You're three years in. Yeah. You've burned through the money. Yes. You have been told no by everybody. And even though you have leveraged all of the steps that were ordered along the way and like an amazing Denny's waitress, you can talk to anybody, (laughs) you can hustle, you can figure it out. Yeah. You have nothing but closed doors in front of you. Yes. And a ton of product and no money. Yes. What is the turning point? Yes. Why did you not give up? Yeah. So- two big things happened. The first uh, was in the form of a crazy painful rejection. So I thought, Mel, um, so we got a call from a big potential investor and very famous for launching all these sort of unknown brands and making them big products we all buy in grocery stores. And, you know, and I thought, and they got a hold of our product. And I thought like, oh, if they invest in A, I'm not going to go bankrupt. B, like they, we can leverage their, their, their clout to get in these stores that keep telling me no. Yeah. Like I had this whole scenario planned out that was like this pretty woman moment, right? Where I was like, oh, he's going to save the day. <laughs> and so we started taking meeting after meeting uh, and, and we, it got down to the final meeting with this huge investment firm. And uh, it was in person. My husband and I actually flew to the meeting and the head guy was about three feet from me. Yeah. And his whole team was there who was awesome. I had just presented our whole future product pipeline. And he says, you know, you should be so proud of this product you're created. you've created. It's really, really good. Uh, but it's a no. We're going to pass on investing in it cosmetics. And I was like, okay, can you tell me why? Because I'm so used to hearing no. And I was yeah. like, okay, even though really I was devastated. But Well, yeah, because they just led you on and you just went through it. And this was supposed to be the meeting where they're like, let's do this. And I was so hopeful and I was so desperate. Yeah. And um, he says, he got very quiet and he says to me, do you want to know you know, do you, or what, I said, I said, can you tell me why? And he says to me, do you want me to be uh, really honest with you? And I said, yes, please. And he got really quiet and he's like three feet from me in person. And he says, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. And when he said that to me, and this is why it was such a big moment for me. When he said that to me, first of all, 
a lifetime of body doubt and self-doubt. Like I remember it flooding my body all at once. And when I looked at him, I actually felt no anger toward him. I felt like I was almost like staring my own fear um, straight in the eye. But when he said those words to me, Mel, and this is what, this is when we talk about purpose and intuition, he said, I just don't think women will buy makeup for someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. The second he said that, I felt this feeling in my gut. Like I can remember it like it was yesterday. This like strong feeling that said, he's wrong. Like I felt it, right? And I didn't know how I was going to prove it, but I felt that feeling. And what I realized later when I look back at that moment, this guy, this dude gave me a no, but God gave me a knowing in that moment, in that moment. And I believe every one of us has had someone tell us we're not the right fit or no, or you don't have what it takes. Sometimes we're the ones telling ourselves that. I don't love you anymore. Yes. Yes, right? But if if you get still and you learn to hear your knowing, I believe which one you listen to, if you listen to the no, all the no's, all the rejections, all the self-doubt, or you get still and listen to you, your knowing, whether that's from your own intuition, from your creator, from the universe, whatever speaks to you, but we all have it. We all have it. And I believe our 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 life and our purpose and, and our entire destiny comes down to which one we listen to. Do you listen to the no or do you listen to the knowing? Okay. I promised a masterclass. That right there is worth a billion dollars. In life, are you going to listen to the no or are you going to listen to the knowing inside of you? That's it. Yeah. As somebody who loves you and as your friend, when you shared that story with me and hearing you tell it again right now, I literally go, I'm going to kill that motherfucker. I, I go, <laughs> I have that, my knowing goes, oh yeah? <laughs> oh yeah? You think, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me show you. Like it's that, like I get that sort of mojo thing going when somebody says no like that at a moment like that. It's like, I'll show you. Yeah. And I guess I just got in this moment, sort of this wake up call that my knowing often feels like I'll show you. Yeah. You missed out. You'll be sorry. What does yours sound like? And it's almost always true. That's almost always true, right? What does yours sound so, like? So is yours yep. like, mm, or is it more of like... I mean, in that case, I was devastated and at the same time had the strong... It, it was just a piece. Honestly, in that moment, it was a piece. He's wrong. And that didn't make sense in my head. Why? Because I had had three years of hundreds of rejections. And this is the thing, right? Jay-Z says the genius thing we did was we didn't give up. Mm. That's it, like one of my favorite quotes of his. In that moment, everything told me to give up, Mel. I mean, it was hundreds of rejections. And now it felt what felt like my last hope of desperation told me something totally different. No, because not only do I not believe in anything you're doing necessarily, but I actually just think you're personally not the right fit. Like women just won't buy makeup from, it was just like, oh my gosh. It was like all of these no's everywhere. And, and, and I want to share that because you know, it's easy for someone to go, oh, wow, she built a billion dollar company. She must have just got lucky. Or maybe she just had so many connections. Or We always think, but, but really what it comes down to sometimes in this case, that big moment for me, do you listen to the no's or do you listen to the knowing, right? Yeah. And, and, and I made that decision that day to trust the knowing, to trust myself. I kept feeling like I was supposed to keep going. I didn't know how, right? And What do you do when you don't even know the next step? So you got this kind of, you know, jerk who's like, yeah, yeah they're not going to buy it because of your body type and this, that, and the other thing. You're like, yeah, yeah you're wrong, motherfucker. Yeah. But what do you do next? And, and so the next right step, the next thing that feels right when you can't even see how the how, heck it's well, How do you even out. determine what the next right step is? Yeah, you just get, for me, I just get still. I pray. I pray. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. I pray. Uh, and I just, but whether for you, you know, listening, it's prayer or it's the universe or, mm. or your intuition, when you get still. All you can do is try to listen, right? And, and try to live that answer, whatever it is, and take that next right step. And I just felt, I just had this knowing I was supposed to keep going. And even when it didn't make sense. And, and you know, I remember crying myself to sleep. I remember writing in my journal, 
um, know your why, then fly, girl, fly. Mm. And I read those words every day till I didn't need the reminder. Um, I would Google stories of people that had gone through thousands of rejections who no one would know that they went through them because they're so successful today. Or, you know, and I just kept trying to sort of build this toolbox of things I could lean on. Um, but I, And how did, how did QVC come about? Because oh, yeah. you built it cosmetics and it became because of you the most successful beauty brand on all of QVC you did yeah. over a thousand appearances yeah so how did you even get onto QVC because that in and of itself is no small feat yeah well you know their their head guy of beauty who's like a legend had said no to me many times no you're not the right fit uh and I happened to be at this this big beauty expo. And was this before or after this guy was like, no, we're not investing? After. After? After. So she has now gotten three years of no's. Yeah. They're almost out of money. Her intuition is knowing that she's going to fly, girl, fly. <laughs> so she is still showing up to a beauty expo yeah. where I want you to understand in the business world, it's like going to a convention where everybody that you have ever fooled around with who has then broken up with you is attending. <laughs> so everybody that has said no yes. to her, yes. you know, she walks in and it's like, oh, here's this chick again, <laughs> the it chick, right? Yep. The yep. it cosmetics person that has been sending me the stuff and calling me and we have told her no, do not make eye contact. So you are now I at this thing. <laughs> This describes it exactly. Yes. Everyone you fooled around with, who broke up with you, and they're like, oh, don't make eye contact. Yeah. Oh, it's God, that. this chick again yeah. with, the, with the skin, with the, okay. Yeah. So you're at this thing. You've yes. been told no by the big, 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 big person. It's been three years. So we're talking like 2011, 2012-ish. What do you do? So I, uh, so you you get this three foot table, right? It's a huge convention. There's six thousand women at this convention. <sighs> wow. They're walking up and down, and it's every beauty brand in the world. Are and they buying it for their stores or no? So what it is? It's it was this big um, cosmetic executive women award show. Okay. And why you're there is you are you get a three foot table. You're demonstrating your product. You're hoping that someone who walks by either wants to carry your product in their stores mm -hmm. or all the press is there. Right. They cover your product or or there's also you can win some big award. So I'm there, and and then all the brands you can imagine, right, are there. And there's six thousand women walking. And when I got there, I saw QVC had this huge booth in the background, and you're not allowed to leave your table, right? And I couldn't afford to get kicked out. Um, but I just kept having this feeling like, okay, I've called them a million times, they've told me no forever, but I've never like met anyone in person, right? So I kept trying to sneak away from my table. And every time I got over there, the buyers would, would be mobbed with people. Mm. I eventually got over there, made my way to one of the buyers, introduced myself, poured my heart out. Like with, I remember sweat just dripping <laughs> through my clothes because I was freaking out down to no money. Yeah. Um, I'll cut a real long story short, but she gave me her card. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like when someone says, oh, DM me on Instagram. You don't know if they meet you, they really right. mean it. Then you're on your Instagram checking your DMs and you're like, oh, they still haven't replied. And I thought, is that what it's going to be like? But she actually meant it. And I, I flew out, had a meeting with her. We got a yes, my first big yes for one shot on QVC. And what it meant, Mel, was I was gonna get this 10 minute segment live on the air, live in front of 100 million homes, and I either had to sell enough product to hit their sales goal yep. um, or not come back. We were only doing one to two orders a day on our website. Okay, and <laughs> one <laughs> to two orders a day, everybody. Yep. After yep. Yep. Three almost years. four, yeah, three years mm -hmm. of this. Yeah. How, this and is barely like, keeping the lights on. Um, and so now you get this, you get your shot. Like I there are those shot. moments in life. Yes. You're at bat. Yep. And you got to be ready for those. Yeah. And so put us right there with you. What happened? Yeah. What happened was I was about to learn one of the greatest life lessons I've ever learned to this day. Um, and he, here's what I mean by that. So I found out I get one shot. and uh, then I learn it's consignment, which means they, uh, so first of all, I had to sell over 6,000 units of our concealer in this 10 minute window to hit their sales goal or not come back, which was about like $130,000 or $140,000 of product in a 10 minute window. I also want to point out to everybody 
that's 10 years of sales on her website at the current amount. Yeah. So in 10 minutes, everybody, yeah. she on live television yeah. has to move 10 years worth of volume she was selling on her website at that time. In one shot. Like in one... one shot. And she'd never done this before. I realize you were a television anchor, but this is a totally different thing. Well, QVC, it's, I mean, you know, it's unlike stores where you can walk in and there's thousands of products in one space. Their one minute of airtime can get one product. So you're competing with the volume of like Apple iPhone or Dyson vacuum. You have to hit these high sales goals. Yeah. And what I quickly learned was the offer was consignment, which meant I wasn't guaranteed to be paid for it. I had to figure out um, how to get a loan to cover the cost of manufacturing uh, 6,000 units of product, shipping it in, going through legal, going through QC, going through all of it. And then I learned if I go on air and it doesn't sell, I have to take it all back oh my God. and therefore go out of business, right? So you should never, ever, ever accept a purchase order you can't afford to lose uh, ever. But at this point, it was like, I think I'm, I don't know what this else is to it. do. This, this is, is it. This is the shot. This is it. And so here's what happened. We went to 22 banks uh, that all said no, and they probably should have. Um, the 23rd bank, which was California Bank and Trust, and uh, gave us a, a loan that covered our very first um, – purchase order and a little bit more. So I took the little bit more. We hired third-party consultants. I'm like, I'm going all in. I want to do the best 10 minutes yeah. I could possibly do. I, I want to I have no regrets. And they all told me the same thing. Which is? Which is, if you want a chance at making it, here's what you need to do. You need to use this type of model to demonstrate your product, which is flawless skin, early 20s, all the same skin tone. And I'm like, okay, but that's inauthentic. That's not why I'm building this brand. I'm like, what if I put models in their 70s and then and someone with hyperpigmentation and someone with acne and 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 what if I take my own makeup off on national TV and I could prove live how the product works? And they were mortified. And here's the thing, Mel, they wanted me to win. Like they were giving me the best advice that they know how. And I This had never been done. So we're is this 2011? This is 2010. Yeah, so 2010, 2010, everybody. Mm -hmm. So this was not something people did. Yeah. Like we're talking about the person who changed the industry mm -hmm. right here. And this is the moment you're hearing it. And everybody that were the quote experts yeah. were saying no. And this goes back to one of the major takeaways that you were learning from our professor of purpose, Jamie Kern Lima. And that is there's a huge difference between a no and a knowing. Mm, yeah. And if huge. you're the only you that will ever exist. Your knowing is the unique difference that you're going to make in this world. Yes. And in this moment, with one shot to go, everything on the line, a loan from one out of 23 banks that was willing, she said, no way to the freaking experts. And she listened to her knowing. So when you walked into QVC with normal human beings, <laughs> no flawless yeah. models, no one with perfect skin, all ages, all body types. Yep, yep. Did people say, wait, you can't take them on the air? Or was there any, like, were people like, oh, she's got, this is just going to be terrible? Like, what was that like when you walked in? Did they even know you were going to take your makeup off? Um, I let them, yeah, I let them know I wanted to. And QVC was great, you know. The, here's the thing about QVC is, like, they want everyone to be their authentic selves. It's just yep. this has never been done this way before. Okay. And... I wish I could say it was easy for me to just go, I'm just going to go with my knowing. But the truth is I flew out there a week early, Mel. I sat in a rental car in the parking lot, cried every day. I actually second guessed myself. I'm like, if I do it, maybe I'll do it their way first. Then I'll make money. Then I'll do it my way. Uh, but I know that, you know, authenticity, you can't fake authenticity. And authenticity alone doesn't automatically guarantee success. But what I do know is in, in authenticity guarantees failure every time. Okay, everybody, stop the professor classes in session. Did you hear that? That inauthenticity, being fake, mm -hmm. trying to do something everybody else's way because that's just you're too insecure to do it your way. Yeah. That never guarantees success. Yeah. Authenticity, your knowing, your special spin on things. Yeah. That is the pathway to purpose and success. Yeah. There is no other way. Yeah. And so after a week of crying in your rental car in the parking lot at QVC, mm -hmm. 
you were like, I'm going with the knowing. I'm going with the knowing. And um, so tell us about that first appearance. You're standing there on a television set. There's yep. a bazillion cameras. The lights are bright. Yeah. You got your models there. Yep. You're taking the risk of your lifetime on live television in front of a hundred million homes. Yes. You are doing something that has never been done on television before. Yeah, I remember literally I wore two pairs of Spanx Mel, not because I cared how I looked, but like I was so freaked out. Like my hands were shaking and I was sweating through my clothes. So I had on double Spanx under my dress. And I remember the moment the the camera went live, right? And there's a big countdown clock on the floor that started at, at 10 minutes. And by the way, a minute or two before I went onto the set, I learned you're not guaranteed your 10 minutes. Why? If you are a minute or two into your cell, and you're not hitting numbers, they know by the second. Your clock, you might think you have eight minutes still to go, and your clock will jump to one or jump <gasps> to two minutes left. Because yeah. your product's a flop. Yep, exactly. And you're a flop. And so you literally are racing against the clock to be successful out of the gate. So what did you do to like hook everybody? Did you take your makeup off right away? Did you like, yeah. what did you do? So, so I, first of all, I go out of the, you know, I, I go live. I remember it was like 9.59, 9.58, 9.58. And I'm like, oh. and I remember I had practiced in my bathroom mirror, right? So many times. If I had known the high five habit then, I would have been way more confident. <laughs> But I was practicing in the bathroom mirror this demonstration a million times on my wrist, how our concealer doesn't crease and the best two selling concealers crease. And I'd done this demonstration like this where I show it and they all start to crease. So I'm holding my wrist up, trying to do this as we go live to show that, but my but my hand's like this now. And it was never like shaking when I was doing it a million times. It wouldn't bend everybody. Like she yeah. was so... So anxiety ridden <laughs> that yes. she's sweating through her two pairs of pangs, Spanx yes. and her wrist will not bend so she cannot demonstrate that her product won't crease. Yes. And the host grabbed my wrist and was like, thank you, sugar. And she took over. <gasps> and then I remember my bright red bare face before shot coming up on national television. I remember walking over to our models, real women, all shapes, sizes, skin tones, skin challenges, calling them beautiful meaning it. Uh, I remember. Do you, did you take, so when did you take your makeup? When so, she grabbed your hand and said, thank you, sugar. Yeah. Yeah. Did that wake you so up sweet. or were you like, I, Mel, I, I was like out of my body. I was so just do you, praying. did you like just then take your makeup off? Well, they did a whole bare face before shot of me for that show. I oh. have, ta I've taken it off live a million times okay. since that okay. first show. It was like, yeah, bare face before shot. And then the after, um, and I remember walking over to them. I remember we were, gosh, six or seven minutes in. I didn't know how we were doing, but I knew we weren't cut yet. Um, and then it got down to like a minute left. And the host said, uh, uh, the deep shade's almost gone. The tan shade's almost sold out. And I was like freaking out. And I remember literally right at the 10 minute mark, this giant um, sold out sign came up across the screen. And I start crying on national television. Oh, I love you. They cut from me and went to like Dyson vacuum or something. <laughs> Um, and I remember my husband came rushing through the double doors of the studio and I, and, and he's like, has his arms up and I'm just sobbing and I'm like, real women have spoken <laughs> and I'm just like crying. And I thought he was going to give me a hug or be all excited. And he just looked at me and he's like, we're not going bankrupt. <laughs> and I was like, ah! <laughs> and I just, that one airing, which was September of 2010, uh, became five more that year, then 101 the next year. And then I did 250 live shows a year um, myself, direct live on, on on QVC year after year. So we built the biggest beauty brand in QVC's history. And the only reason that I share that is because it was years of no, and mm. you're not the right fit. And 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 what I love for, for anyone listening who needs to hear this is no one can tell you you're not the right fit. No one. And you can get all the no's in the world, but you have your knowing. And 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 by the way, I believe this, Mel. I believe even when you trust your knowing and then it seems like it was wrong and things don't go your way over and over and over. Like I look back at those moments, right? I really wanted that investor to invest in us. Thank God he didn't. Oh when God. I say everything's happening for us, what I mean is like, if he, I was so desperate that if he would have invested in us then, I probably would have given him the majority of the company for probably right. almost no money, right. right? By the time, many years, six years later, after that day, six years later, when um, L'Oreal bought this little company I started in my living room for $1.2 billion cash, it was still, I was the largest shareholder. Paulo and I were the largest shareholders. And I look back and it's like, oh gosh, thank God. 
uh, the, the, all the no's happened when they did, even when they sucked, even when it felt like it wasn't fair. Mm. Um, and I can look at that in many scenarios. Sometimes we don't have some big positive outcome, but we learn a purpose through a no. Right. Right? We learn a calling through a no. Um, we learn a lesson. We build strength. We build resiliency. We appreciate the beautiful moments so much more when we've gone through the tough ones. So have you ever seen that investor since? <laughs> I have not seen him. Uh, the day that we... Of course, I asked the petty question. I'm like, have you ever like seen him to like... <laughs> Twist the little knife in there. Okay. So, so uh, I heard from him one time ever mm -hmm. again, and it was six years later, the day that L'Oreal announced the deal. So, because they're a public company, they announced, um, you know, that they had acquired it cosmetics, maybe the first woman to hold a CEO title of a brand in their 107 year history. They did the big press release. So, that's kind of surprising. 107 years, L'Oreal, a makeup company, you're, it's it took them that long to have the first female CEO of a brand? I hope they have many more now. That is my yes. prayer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You were you were the trailblazer there too. It's uh it's been yeah, so many things. <laughs> it's been a journey. And here's the thing, Mel, it was another woman inside L'Oreal. It was Carol Hamilton who was head of luxury for North America. She'd been there gosh, 30 plus years and she championed mm. for me to keep my CEO title, all the things. Like it was another woman saying, "Oh, and and it's funny because I actually think she should have been the first woman." You know what I mean? And I think, mm -hmm. again, um, there's an example, by the way, of, of I believe, I'm not going to speak for her, I believe she knows. This is my opinion. I think she probably knows she should be the first female CEO. But look how she used what she went through to then, boom, be of purpose and of service and help make sure that I kept my CEO title. Um, you know, everything we go through. Um, but so so they announced it, right? So all of a sudden, it was a homepage of Wall Street Journal, the press everywhere, and that was the first time and only time since that I heard from that potential investor. And what did he say? He said, congratulations on the L'Oreal deal. I was wrong, is what he said, and wished me the best of luck. And uh, uh, That's a so big deal to admit you're wrong. It is. Um, and, uh, and so when you speak about petty, so I, what I did say to him was thank you. But what I wanted to say, <laughs> like, <laughs> what did you want to say? <laughs> so in that moment, here's what I thought about. I, I thought about, um, do you remember the movie Pretty Woman where, where like she goes in the store and they wouldn't help her? Mm -hmm. And then she goes back. Remember when she goes back? Yes. So I wanted to say to him, big mistake. Huge. Huge. <laughs> I could give you 1.2 billion reasons why it was a huge mistake. Um, but I didn't. I wouldn't have wanted to be him in that situation. You know, we probably would have been one of the most successful investments in his firm's history, you know. And so, listen, it wasn't uh, reject. I always say rejection is God's protection so often, you know. There's another one, everybody. Rejection <sighs> is God's protection. Yeah. It's a good way to frame it. And I think when you look in the rear view mirror, you know that all the rejections you've faced, especially in relationships, were mm. there to protect you. I think the true thing that you've taught me through your story and through the example that you continue to set, Jamie, is that true power and, and grace and grit and belief is about seeing that in front of you, mm. not behind you, mm. that the, the rejections that you're facing right now that you can look ahead and realize it's protecting you in this moment. So let's talk about the gut then, because yeah. there's multiple things that you just said there that all you've led back to the gut. Mm. And yeah. in hindsight, everyone listening and watching are going, well done for trusting your gut. Mm. But there are many times that at least for me, I've trusted my gut and I was wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I've learned my lesson and then yeah. I move on. Yeah. So um, so I want to start with your on your news anchor. You've got the blotches. Nothing was working for you. You're going yeah. to try your own. A, what made you trust your gut in that sense? Because like you said, you've um, you had college debt. So you have mm -hmm. all this stuff that's stacked yeah. against you. Yeah. It's based on beauty, which for women is very emotional. Yeah. Um, so how did you keep going and like try to find a solution instead of just hide away? Like what are the things mm. that you told yourself that pushed you to keep going and trust your gut that this was the right path for you? Mm -hmm. 
I've always had this feeling deep down inside, like I'm meant to do great things mm. that help other people. Um, it, I've always kind of just known mm. it. Even when I took the low paying job to learn journalism instead of like a super high paying, mm. um, you know, consultant right. or banking job. Um, I just felt, I just feel like if we get one life, I want to like, the day I die, which God willing, it's a long time in the future. Like I want to literally know there's nothing left in me mm. that could have been used to help someone else. And you felt that even back when you were the news anchor. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So because I actually yeah. didn't feel like that. No? I do now. You do I feel now. Like, yeah. I feel like so now, you know like it, my, right? that my purpose of all the failures I've had, all the problems, all the health issues, my purpose now is to speak it so that yes. it can help other people. And but it back, does. But back when I you. started, it didn't. Mm. It was actually, if I can be so honest, it was out of pure ego. Mm. So when people told yeah. me, you can't do it, you're not good enough to do it, you're dumb, you're stupid, yeah. what are you doing, you're not yeah. talented, I was just um, what's it, stubborn enough to say, I can do it. I'm going to prove them wrong. And right. it was out of stubbornness, not out of like, I want to share it with the world, yeah. that actually pushed me to then show myself yeah. what I was capable of. So you were driven by ego because so, you're like, I'm going to prove them wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Then I yeah. realized, wow, I'm actually, I actually did do it and I'm kind of capable. And yes. so then it's like, well, if you're capable, what else can you do? Yes. And so that became the foundation of then, okay, I maybe I have a superpower. Mm -hmm. So if I have a superpower now, how am I going to help others? So it kind of became a transition for me versus yeah. then just an initial like from the beginning. So that's why it's really impressive yeah. that you felt that even before you had any validation mm, yeah. that you can do it or that you, you, know, you have the ability to do it. Yeah, I've always had that, just that feeling. And it's funny that you say this, I've definitely done things for ego. I have definitely done things for ego. And most of the time when I do that, I regret it. Oh, it doesn't feel right, boy, I right? You know what I'm saying? And sometimes I do stuff on ego and it, it turns out great and whatever, but it's like, it doesn't compare to that feeling of knowing you're doing something bigger than yourself. Mm -hmm. I feel like when you spend the time to really think about your why and why you're doing it, you know, why or how it's bigger than yourself, that will sustain you through so many hard times, right? Because just hearing some of what you're sharing, I'm having flashbacks even to, to so many of the of the hard times, even even once we finally got yeses and finally we're on QVC and all of that, it's it, when you're putting in 100 hour weeks and when stuff doesn't go your way and all that, and when your why is bigger than yourself, mm. it, it, it sometimes it's like that's the only thing that gets you through those hard times and, and keeps you going. Because sometimes if it's just for ourselves or our own ego, it's not a strong enough why. When you are so burnt out and you feel defeated and you feel like self-doubt's entering your mind, it's like money isn't a strong enough why because um, you can go get another job and get money. You know what I mean? It's like. It's like really peeling back the layers on what you're doing and really getting to that, that, that true why that means so much to you. And for some people it's, I'm going to change this generation of my family. Where I come mm. from is not where I'm going. I'm not going to have my children grow through what I went through, right? And that why is huge. It doesn't have to be a why to go change the outside world. It might be a why to change inside your own home. And sometimes just like not, just, just not giving up and just keeping going is like, is, is the difference too in, in making it, you know what I mean? Oh, so how do you do that then when you're in a moment, yeah. so you've got your why, very yeah. strong why yes. you're going to impact women and how they feel about themselves. It's yes. not just like you want to make them super glamorous. It's yeah. like, you're going to change how they feel about themselves yeah. and that can lead to so many incredible things, being a better mother, being a better wife, being yeah. a better employee, a better business owner, whatever it is, mm -hmm. I think that can really lead to something. Yeah. Um, so you've got your strong why. Now, you've got your strong why, but you only have $1,000 left. Yes, I know. How do you, is the why strong enough to get you through it? Or yeah. was there something else that you had to do to tell yourself, like, no, keep going? Because that's where people go like, all right, look, mm -hmm. at some point, if something is failing, yeah. at some point you have to let it go. Yeah, so, uh, so two things. So for me, um, and this is so personal to everyone and to what they believe in, yeah. for me, faith is huge in my life and I feel like I hear my faith through my gut feelings. Mm, you know, okay. I really do. And 
Um, and there were nights where I was just like, is this what we're supposed to do? That combined with really freaking hard work. Mm. And like, let's just keep it really real because sometimes, and I love, I don't know how we're going here to Denny's and all the really real stuff, but what I let's love about it, it yeah. is, you know, if, if any of your, 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 you know, your community has heard any of my story before, they've probably just heard the, the billion dollar right. fairy tale. And right. the, the real real of it is when we were under a thousand dollars, I, we were trying to get SBA loans from anyone that would give one. No one would give one. And they shouldn't have because <laughs> right. it's like, you know, you're trying to show a business plan for, for projected sales when you don't even have any, you know, we were doing two to three orders a day on our website. Um, but you know what? It, it's a choice. Yeah. I chose instead of having a job that paid me a salary, I chose to be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, but you got to hustle and you got to, you know, sometimes that's what you, you have to just do. Because you didn't take um, like a day off, right? You, oh you no. guys, you and your husband worked like a hundred hour work week, seven days weeks. a week for, yes, 10 for 10 years. And I think it, like yes. you said, it's important to stress that. You freaking busted your ass. Yeah, we, we did. And it was like when we finally, when we were under, we got down to a thousand dollars, we went and spent part of it on Ikea desks to put in the living room because we had an in-person office tour with California Bank and Trust, which was the last bank that was going to consider giving us an SBA loan. And, uh, but that, you know, we got the last, the last person said yes on the SBA loan, which kept us alive a little bit longer. Mm. We were still only doing the two to three orders a day from our website and uh and and right around that time we got a first yes finally for qvc but we had one shot and only 10 minutes um uh and and you'd been going after qvc for for a long time going right? after him for a long time and always hearing no i i remember oh my gosh like the number of no's from everybody. And so, so there is a guy named Alan Burke who was like the head of beauty at QVC. Mm -hmm. And he got all of those like really high end department store beauty brands to really want to go on QVC mm -hmm. and all the designer brands. And so he was the head of all of it. And I remember one day I finally got, um, and it was a call from his assistant saying he wants to have a call with you. He's reviewed your product. And I like thought this was going to be our big break. And he, he was very quick. <laughs> And he said, um, I've reviewed your product with our buyers and you're not the right fit for QVC. Uh, I'm sorry and I wish you the best of luck. And I just remember crying myself to sleep that night and just, you know, have you ever like had something happen where, you know, that goes wrong or doesn't go your way and then like the next day you wake up and you like hoped it was a dream? Yes. And then you're like, it wasn't. You have to relive it almost, yes. Yeah. So for you, in those moments, you're hearing no over and over again. Most people would have stopped at number one. Yeah. A lot of people would have stopped at number two. Majority would have stopped at number three. You kept going. Kept going. This was like yeah. years and years and years of you like hounding Sephora and QVC. And so yes. what is it? Is it just your innate ability to get back up? Or did you have to coach yourself in your mind to say, no, you believe in this, remember your why? Like, what does it actually yeah, look like? Both. I feel like when I look back on things, mm -hmm. and this is what I love, yeah. it's like even if you're in a space right now in your life where you're like, I, this isn't where I want to be, mm -hmm. I would just trust it because I look back at like when I was, when I was a news anchor. I would get emails that were so mean, like, are you pregnant? Are you, right? I had a news director at one of my jobs that would um, just tear me to shreds, um, appearance-wise, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I, I really feel like it helped make me really, it helped me get really strong mm -hmm. so that rejection started to hurt a little less, um, but it still hurts. Um, it still hurts, but resiliency is like the most important skill, I think. Mm -hmm. I think what's tricky is going, okay, Am I putting good money after bad, right? Which is like a famous saying, meaning, does every sign tell me this is a bad idea and do I keep wasting my time and money? You know what I mean? That's the mm -hmm. hardest thing to know, especially when you're building your business. And for me, the deciding factor for me was, was praying about it and realizing that I needed to keep my faith bigger than my fear because I just felt in my gut what I was doing mattered and it was needed. I think fear kills more dreams than like almost anything else. Self-doubt and fear, I think kills more dreams than almost anything. I was um, reading that famous Jay-Z quote where he says, um, the genius thing we did was we never gave up. Mm. And it's like, it's so true sometimes. 
And, and what's crazy is I would, have, I would have saved myself so many nights of crying myself to sleep had I known what I know now, mm. which is just that if you're doing something novel or that, that, that's different, that hasn't been done before, of course, all these people that are experts aren't going to get it right away because there's no, it's never been done before. So there's no proof out there that tells them, oh yeah, this is a good idea. Or, oh yeah, this is going to succeed in your stores or, you know, it, it's never been done before. So I shouldn't have been surprised yeah. that all these people that I thought were like, you know, they would know if, you know, they're going to see our product and like love it right away. And the other thing I learned was by persistence and by not letting those no's destroy every ounce of, uh, of, of confidence I had. And every single person that told us no has now told us yes. But some of them told us no for years mm. and many, many, many times. And here's the crazy thing, and I don't know the answer to this, but what I do know, Lisa, is had I listened to any of a lot of the ways they told me to change our product or change our positioning, had I listened to that, I don't think our brand would have worked. Yeah. I don't think I'd be sitting here having sold it to L'Oreal because L'Oreal has a, a lot of other great brands that do what's already been done really well. They're the best at it in the world. Had I not done something totally different that went against what all these other experts were saying to do, it, I wouldn't have created something of value that complemented their portfolio. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's like, I think it's um, Peter de Mendes. I think he said this, uh, the day before a breakthrough is just another dumb idea. Ah, and it's yes. like, it's so true. Yes. Because yes. you're getting no's a million times. You're also yes. telling people, uh, people are being mean. Like yeah. in my intro, I said someone said to you, you know, who's ever going to buy makeup from you? Yeah. So again, that like was one of the toughest things I've ever dealt with in my own head. Oh, because explain. what had happened was, so so we had no money, as you know, as we've covered. <laughs> and um, this, the, this investor who, he had invested in a lot of consumer product companies. So he had a a big, um, he was the head of a, a big private equity firm, mm. and a lot of companies I love uh, were his products that he had invested in and sold. Okay. And uh, we finally got a meeting with him, and he was super interested. In, so it's someone you're super excited about. Yes. Someone you're yes. amped about. Someone have a you lot admire, of respect for. Respect. Yes. Okay. That's even yes. makes it even worse. I know. And 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 they loved our idea of what we were doing with our products of their company. I'm like, this is amazing because if they invest in us, then um, a I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go bankrupt tomorrow. And B, maybe they can help us get into these, these retail stores. And like, I just, I was so excited. And then I, I'll never forget this. In person, this guy was like a foot and a half from me. Um, and, and they said, we're gonna, we've decided to pass on the investment. It's a no. And I said, well, can you share with me a little bit why? Cause you know, feedback's always a mm -hmm. gift, even when we don't wanna hear it. And, um, and he said, well, do you want me to be honest with you? And I said, yes. And he goes, I'm not sure if women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you, you know, with your body and your weight, is what he said to me. And I remember looking at him and, and just like, while I tried to handle it with grace and just say thank you for your, you know, thank you for your feedback, I knew so strongly in my gut in that moment. So it was this combination of being hurt, really obviously hurt, but I just had this strong gut feeling that said he's wrong. Like he's wrong. And sometimes you just need to like bust out Google and just inspire yourself. So I, I remember after he said that, just for myself, I would look up so many of the people I admire most who I think are just making huge changes in the world. And I would ask myself, if they changed their body, would they do better? No. Like if they got all skinny or got all whatever it is. Like people that change the world, what they look like, I think is is irrelevant. I think it's how they feel, it's their heart, it's their intentions. And and I would just, you know, fill myself up with stuff like that just to get myself back to that place of confidence again. Mm -hmm. And when we finally, so here's the thing, uh, we got to a beauty show, this big beauty show in New York City. There are 6,000 women there and they walk the show. And what happens in the show, this is how we got on QVC, by the way. If you're a brand that's had a new product launch that year, you can pay money to go there. You get a three foot table and you demonstrate your product. And so we had signed up to do it. And the hope by doing this is that the 6,000 women walking and testing out all the new products, that one of them will, you know, um, 
uh, work for a department store and get you in there, or yeah. one of them, will, you know, or they'll vote on your product and you'll, you'll get one of the awards. And so we were there doing that, and QVC had a huge booth there. And uh, you're supposed to stay, you're not allowed to leave your three foot table. But I kept like trying to sneak away to see like if there were the buyers at the QVC booth and I'd rush back to my table. And <laughs> what I didn't realize is one of the women that had I'd been showing the product to was a QVC show host. And I didn't recognize her and at the time. And I don't know if I was just spacing out or what. And I, you know, so I was showing her the product and like telling her how much, you know, why it exists and why it's different and special. And she said, uh, you know, my name is Miss Lisa. Mason, I'm a QVC show host, and uh, and I just looked at her, and she goes, I want you to know, I think your concealer is really special, and I think our women at, at home, our QVC gals, they would love this product, and um, and I want you to know, I just went and told the buyer, I think we should have your product on, and I looked at her, and tears just started streaming down my face, and I think I freaked her out. She's like, oh, sugar, I don't have any, <laughs> like, I mean, she's like, oh, well, who, what did I just say? Yeah, she's yeah, like, yeah. I don't have any power to get your, I just want to let you know I did this, yeah, I believe yeah. in you, and I was like, thank you, and I was like, can I send you product? Aww. She's like, no, sugar, but, you know, I just want to let you know, I don't and um, so long story short, we got a meeting uh, at QVC and we got a yes. Uh, but what that meant was we have 10 minutes, one airing of 10 minutes, um, and you either hit their sales goal or you don't come back, right? And what I know now that I didn't know at the time is you might have 10 minutes, but if you're live on the air and you're not hitting numbers, all of a sudden your clock will go from 10 to 6. And then you're like, and you can't, you can't panic and you have to have fun because, <laughs> and you can't try to sell because the second you try to sell, nothing sells. Nothing sells. Nothing sells. So, <laughs> and like, and it'll be at six minutes and like, if it's really not doing well, it cuts to two. And what's so hard is you're live on national mm -hmm. television and you know, in the back of your head, I just lost a product or I just lost, mm -hmm. like, it's so much pressure. Thankfully, I didn't know that part in the, the first airing, but what I did know was we had 10 minutes and we had to hit a sales target or never come back. And uh, we needed to uh, sell over 6,000 units of our concealer in that 10 minute Whoa. window. And I just felt like, okay, if women can see this live on television, how it works, like, and they can see how it will, you know, change their lives. I can show it live on TV. And I just felt like this is it. And then here's where this appearance stuff resurfaced, right? And for any woman out there or man who struggles with like, do what I look matter? Does my weight matter? Does my size matter? Do my clothes matter? It sucks when sometimes things all around us tell us they do, right? And this is a moment where I had to make a decision where everything was on the line for my business. And what had happened, Lisa, was we um, had met with, out, there's all these outside consultants and they help a lot of people do well on television. And okay. um, you know, they'll give you advice, like here's how you, you know, do your demonstrations and here's the type of models mm. to use and here's you know, what to say and not to say. And, and when I met with all the consultants, they, they all told me I needed to do uh, this formula to work on air, which was cast only perfect skin models, um, all like the same age and skin tone and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, but I want to show my bright red rosacea and show how this works for me. Mm -hmm. And I want to show real women that are different ages and have different skin problems. And I want women all across the country that have never seen a model who looks like them and skin that looks like theirs. I want to show them live why I made this product. Mm -hmm. And every single uh, uh, consultant said that will not work. And if they want, if I want to have any chance of succeeding in my business, that I will do what they're saying, which is to do the formula, the only formula that had ever worked in beauty. And it was the most stressful, probably moment of my whole career and decision of my whole career because everything was on the line. Yeah, break it down and then how you decided to just ignore them and yeah. do your own thing. Because like you said, everything's on the line. Yeah. What did that process look like yeah. for you where you said they're experts, but I'm still not gonna listen? So I flew, I was freaking out. I flew out to QVC um, a week early. I love the honesty, um, by the way. That's oh my laughing. gosh, it's just, it was, 
and it's so funny. I took, because we had no money, so I took this, it was like three or four connections because it was the cheapest way to get to Philly. Um, I got there, I was in a rental car, and I drove to the QVC parking lot every single day for a week, and I sat there, literally trying to envision what was gonna happen in that 10 minutes, um, almost like the way I imagine Olympic athletes envision success, and I just knew in that moment, like I knew what I needed to do. I knew that if I, if I went on QVC and did what everyone else had done, maybe my business would have succeeded at that time, but A, it wouldn't have been authentic to who I am. I am not a makeup artist. I don't do makeup artist looks on people. It's not why I created the brand. It's not my why. Mm -hmm. So I would have been putting money and fear above the why I did this. And I just remember sitting in the parking lot and knowing I, even if I try and I go out there and I show my bare face, which is the last thing I want to do right. on national television, showing my bright red rosacea, but it wasn't about me. It was about, I wanted to shift culture and beauty. I wanted there to be models that look like real women. I imagine real women all across the country who have forgotten that they're beautiful and have forgotten that they matter. And I realized in that moment, I, if I don't sell and we miss the sales goal, at least for that 10 minutes, there will be women that turn their television on and they see models, aspirational models, who I'm standing on television calling beautiful that look like them. And I'm showing women with, with skin problems and issues and I want them to know we're all in this together, like we've all got this. But it was so scary and I remember the camera goes live, the clock's at 10 minutes, and I remember it started counting down. And, and I had this demonstration planned on my wrist, right, with where I put these two uh, beautiful department store concealers that are top sellers and ours, and I would bend my wrist and show, they start breaking up and cracking, right, and ours doesn't, which is why it would cover my rosacea. So I had this thing planned and I started doing it, but I was so stressed out. TV, I'm not nervous for. It was the business, the weight of everything. Mm. And my hand was like this. And I was like, just like shaking like crazy. Shaking. And I was trying to show. And finally, Lisa's like, thank you, sugar. And she shoves my <laughs> hand under the, the podium that we're presenting from. And I remember um, at the 10 minute mark, literally the 10 minute mark, the sold out sign came up. And I just looked at Lisa yeah. and I just started crying. Because mm. I was like, it was like real women had spoken. I'm so glad I listened to my gut. Mm. And I think sticking with the authenticity of our brand, even when everyone was saying it wasn't going to resonate, mm. is why I, it's the only reason that we now built a billion dollar company. Um, something you just said actually, so you, you've spent so much time and energy and effort putting every ounce of your being into it yes. you and your husband yeah being super authentic making sure yeah. that you don't divert from your authenticity mm -hmm. um being true to who you are and then you sell the company yeah that was amazing but now are you ready to get into the weeds on this idea let's do it in your book you talk about developing your intuition how do people develop their intuition so that when they need to turn to it and they learn to be still and listen to it, that it actually gives them good advice. Yeah. The very first step is to pay attention, right? Which it's, listen, we are so busy in our lives right now. And so many of us with all the stuff going on with, with, the pandemic with this, with that, with our job with, and then frankly, at the end of some days, all I want to do is scroll Instagram or like yesterday, eat candy hearts for Valentine's day. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to like actually put in the work, but I believe that it's so important. Like if, if someone's going to do anything and you hear so much about morning routine or this or that or whatever, taking five minutes a day and just starting building that muscle and at first it may make no sense, right? Especially because so many people are out of practice, but literally getting still, even if you have to just go sit in a closet, leave your phone out, just go sit in a closet and just see what you think. And, and, you know, and, and can you hear your own truth? And another thing I would say just as a real fundamental level is to look back at 
your past because I believe it's something we build over time if we pay attention, right? And I can say that most of my mistakes I've made when I look back is because I didn't trust my own gut and I trusted my mind instead. And my mind was able to say, oh, these are all the experts. They're experts for a reason. Uh, they're touted visionaries and they're telling you to change this about your product packaging or they're telling you to do this about, and they have a proven track record and you don't. So even though, Jamie, you have some gut feeling like go, you know, my mind won. And when, when that's happened, those are some of my biggest mistakes. And I think looking back on that's important just to like break it down at a real fundamental level. So many of us have dated the person we know is not right for us. You know what I mean? But we know, right? And I can think of times where I was dating a guy who I was so into and like his phone broke and he disappeared. And I knew he's lying. <laughs> I knew it, but I didn't want to know it. I didn't want to know it, right? So what, what happens? I'm like, oh, well, it's only the first time it's ever happened. Maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe all the things, right? I know he's sketchy. I know he's lying, right? But we sometimes we know, and this is such a basic example, and we just choose to not to, 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 to talk ourselves out of it anyway, right? And I think that every human being can really actually just put in a little time thinking about different moments in their life. And actually start to remember, like, did I have a gut feeling about this at the time or did I not? Or, you know, did I, was there a time I listened to that inner knowing and I was right, right? And we start thinking about those times and it, it starts to build up our own trust in ourselves over time. And for me, this was a, this was a huge way that I was able to keep going. I, um, you, you mentioned one thing that, that, I mean, I, I remember, um, Tom after, you know, this, we were a couple years into our business and, uh, I had been sending our product out to all the retailers and saying, Hey, I want to show models that actually have skin challenges like I do. And that had never been done before. Right. And I wanted to do all these things and they were all telling me no, and it's not the right fit. And I knew my product was really good. Um, I learned the lesson, the hard lesson, a lot of entrepreneurs learn that you can have a great product or a great course or a great service or a great, but that's not enough. Like people have to know it exists, <laughs> right? And when you have no money and no ad budget, that's really hard. And this is 2008, 2009. Uh, 2010, YouTube wasn't huge yet. So no one had gone out there and said, oh, instead of overly Photoshopped, perfect skin models, let's show real people with real skin challenges and all ages and sizes and skin tones. And that's what I had this vision for because that's what I was, you know? And, and we created a product that was so good. And then after all these rejections from all the department stores, all the beauty stores saying, no, thank you. It's a pass. Your product will never sell. Those kind of images don't work. I had one store tell me women will only buy from a, a, an aspirational image of beauty. They'll never be able to look like if they can actually look that way, they won't buy it. And it was just like over and over and over rejection. Um, and I'll never forget this one moment just to share as an example, because it helped me develop my intuition muscle so strongly but we had gotten an inbound call from a potential investor and, uh, and they were a really well-known private equity company. And they invested in a lot of consumer products, uh, in the grocery stores, like household names that we buy, they uh, loved our product. And so we started taking meetings with them and I was so freaking excited because I felt like, Oh my gosh, if they invest in us, then maybe they'll use their leverage to get us into these retailers and also, I won't go bankrupt and all those there's things. That. And um, there's that. And uh, and so we did meetings. We started the diligence phase. We presented product pipelines, all that stuff. And it got down to the last meeting. And my husband and I flew there for the meeting. And it was the head guy. He was standing about three feet from me. And I thought it was going to be like the best day of my life, right? And I'll never forget, he was three feet away. And he says to me, I just don't think women, well, he's the first, he said, it's a no, we're going to pass on investing in it cosmetics. And like, I'd heard no thousands of times. Right. So I'm like devastated, but I'm like, okay, um, can you share why, you know, cause feedback, um, 
is usually a gift. And, uh, and he says, do you want me to be really honest with you? And I said, yes. And he literally was three feet from me. And he said, I just don't think women will buy makeup from someone who looks like you with your body and your weight. And I remember when he said that to me, a bunch of things happened. The first thing was, I, I remember feeling like my whole body fled with like a lifetime of body issues, body doubt and self-doubt. And I felt all that. So it kind of felt like I was staring my own fear straight in the eye, talking to him. I never felt anger toward him. I felt hurt and crushed. Uh, but I also got this feeling. I'll never forget this time. I'll never forget this the rest of my life. I got this feeling like literally in my gut, like I'm knowing he's wrong. Even though I was still doubting myself, even though I had dealt with like a lifetime of body doubt, I got this feeling he's wrong. And I remember that feeling because I remember then for a few years wondering, like, am I right or is he right? I would still doubt myself, right? And and I went out in my car and I cried and I had to figure out how do I turn down the volume in my own head and not replay those hurtful words uh, over and over and over. But I also remember that feeling I got. And, and I don't, this is a big business thing, not to be off topic, but like one of the things I did do right was I never took rejection personally in business, right? I always figured out how to go, okay, like if this is a game of chess, maybe we will partner one day. So I'm just going to pretend we are with every retailer with every, and I'm just going to keep sending them product and keep sending them updates and keep telling them, I can't wait till I'm in your store no matter how bad that rejection hurt. And in his case, what I realized also was, oh, okay, the reason I'm creating this company, I want to try to shift culture and beauty. I want to try to use different images of models. And he's literally passing on investing in my company because he is just as much influenced by a lifetime of seeing beauty images too. So he believes also, whether he realizes it or not, you look a certain way to sell product. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is I do believe in that famous saying that like rejection's God's protection, right? And you could say rejection's the universe's protection. I do believe in sayings like that. And when you fast forward six years later, the day that L'Oreal bought it cosmetics, uh, it was all over the like the Wall Street Journal homepage, it was everywhere online because they hit their public company. So that means for them, they decided to release the purchase price, everything. I got an email from that guy, from that investor. I got an email that day that said, uh, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. I was wrong. But the other thing, when I talk about like rejections, God's protection, I really believe that because even though we don't see it at the time and it doesn't make sense at the time, but like I was so desperate, Tom, I would have probably given him the majority of the company for like almost no money and because he didn't believe in us and because so many people rejected us along the way, by the time we did sell our business to L'Oreal, we we're still the largest shareholders. So it was like, there's so many situations like that. But anyhow, that deep knowing, that knowing he's wrong, that's an example of, okay, looking back over time, where did I make mistakes and where did I do things right? And then we refine that muscle of, of, of learning. Oh yeah, you know, learning to trust ourselves. There's so much in that. That is extraordinary. We're now going <laughs> to test my abilities as an interviewer to see if I can tease out some of the things that you talk about in the book to put a capstone on this idea of training your intuition. So I have a deep and abiding fear of being spiritual entertainment. People will be moved by you. They will be moved by your story. But if they're very careful and they pay close attention, it will change how they move through the world, certainly as a person just pursuing goals, but potentially even as somebody who wants to start their own business. What did you believe was possible then? And did you learn to trust your gut then? Like, when did you start learning to trust your intuition, to hear those voices? Because I, I get impulses too. I get hits of what I'm supposed to do. And I think some people don't get them. So you share a lot of tips in the book, by the way. So we're not gonna be able to share everything on this interview. Read the book. Jamie shares a ton of tips in this book to help you on your journey. If you're a small business, her advice is incredible. If you're growing your business, if you're a big business, if you're a leader, yeah. if you're someone who's an entrepreneur, if you're someone who wants to be more creative, all of the chapters in that book give you nuggets of wisdom and advice and tips to help you on your journey. It's like really is for everyone, just so you know. So you're going to get some tips, but, but Jamie, in terms of that intuition and gut, 
Tell us about that Denny's waitress that you were and what was possible then to you? Yeah. So I've always felt, and you know, um, I've always felt deep down inside, like, like I was destined to um, serve in a big way or do something that, that impacted other people uh, on all of our own journey. I always had that inkling, didn't know what it was. And uh, working as a Denny's waitress, this is so funny, working as a Denny's waitress, oh my gosh. So, so the Denny, and I was, I was working to try and save up for, for school and all that. Uh, and pay my way through school. And uh, Denny's, it's so funny how so many things teach us lessons, right? So I won't get into this too much, but like the Denny's I worked at, the kitchen was a mess in the sense that they would take an hour to get pancakes out sometimes. So I'm an introvert by nature. And I was like, oh my gosh, people are getting mad and they're leaving because it's taking an hour to get pancakes. Uh, and, and I'm not getting a tip. And I really need a tip because I'm trying to pay for through school. And so I learned to talk to people and try to be like, and try to just connect with them and, 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 and ask about their stories and that whole thing. And, and it probably planted a seed in me of understanding the importance of operations of a business and the right operational infrastructure. So even as a, even as a, you know, in that whole different industry as a Denny's waitress, I really think every single thing we go through in life helps us uh, build that foundation, right, of, of where we're, we're, we're going to be. But, you know, in the time I was a Denny's waitress, here's really where my gut started speaking to me. And this is for everybody out there. It's never too late to start learning how to hear your own intuition, right? Most people never do. Most people never do. But just like faith or like anything else, I think it's never too late. I think everyone can start now. And I, I really think that it's a journey. It's a journey of building on experiences and then looking back and going, oh, I didn't listen to my gut there. I had that instinct and, 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 and it didn't go so well. Or, oh, I, I decided to go against everyone else. I trusted my gut and here's what happened, right? And I think for all of us, it's every area of life. I mean, this is something a lot of your community might relate to uh, is like, or not, but if you've ever dated a sketchy guy or, <laughs> or you have a friend where you're just like, I don't think they're telling me the truth. Something's not adding up. We kind of know it, right? Like, like so many people can hopefully, <laughs> hopefully relate to this at some point in their life, but they've dated someone where they're like, I don't really believe him that his phone just broke and that he just like disappeared for it. Right. I, I don't think he, like he, you know, you, you know, and you can choose, we all choose like, Oh, I'm just going to ignore it. And I'm just going to stay in love <laughs> or you know what? Like, okay, I'm done. Like we all know. And I feel like we continue building those experiences in life. Um, and, and then we look back on them and, and it's like, now I'm able, you know, uh, looking back on so, so much of this journey, I'm able to really know that some of my biggest mistakes and misjudgments and miscalculations came when I went against that inkling inside, right? And I trusted people that are touted visionaries or, or, or experts. And it's good to trust experts and visionaries, except if your gut, if your deep gut inkling goes against it, because knowing that you stayed to that through line of authenticity for you and what you're called to do is so important. And learning how to tune in and hear that can literally change the whole course of your life. And one, uh, one big example of that is probably one of the greatest business lessons I've ever learned and, and life lessons. And it came down to this moment where after three years of hearing no's, and by the way, John, at one point, I think it was two years into our business, I actually was able to get, oh, and just to share a scrappy tip for anyone out there like really building their business who can't afford to hire people, I was like, emailing everyone on LinkedIn. I was, I would find anyone that worked at the company. I would just try to get in some way, send them products, ask them to, you know, and I'd finally like hustled my way into a guy named Alan Burke, who is the head of all of beauty at QVC. Uh, he had built this billion dollar, multi-billion dollar beauty industry there, a, a, a department there. And I got through to his assistant and I begged her to like have him look at our product and get us meetings and all those things in front of the buyers. And anyways, long story short, I got a, a, a call saying he is going to take a call with me and he's reviewed the products. And I thought, oh my gosh, 
this head of everything, Alan Burke, if he's going to spend his precious time, like calling me, it's going to be good. Right. And I was so excited. And I was in, I was pacing around waiting for the call in our office, which was our living room. And, um, and Paula was there and I was like, oh, I was freaking out. He called. And right when I answered the phone, obviously I was like, like, I mean, we had, I didn't know what we were going to do, right? We were down to no money. I was freaking out. And I, uh, I said, you know, okay, I, to my head, I'm like, they're lucky to have us. I'm going to be, he's lucky to get us, like all these things, right? Pumping myself up. And I got on the phone and he said, you know, hello, Jamie, this is Alan Burke from QVC. Uh, and I'm like, Alan, it's so great to talk to you and this whole thing. And anyways, he got right to the point and he said, we've reviewed your products with all the buyers here in the beauty department. And it's unanimous that it's a no we're going to pass on, uh, on your company. You're not the right fit for QVC and you're not the right fit for our customers, but we wish you well. And I was like, oh, but I am the right fit. And I just tried to pour into another pitch. And uh, he thanked me for loving QVC, but said it's a no, got them. Okay. So then I cry myself to sleep three nights in a row. <laughs> uh, if you've ever had bad news and you like wake up in the morning and you hope it was a dream and you're like, Oh, it wasn't, right? It was like that day after day after day. So fast forward another year, we're at a big beauty show and one of the QVC hosts tried our product. There were 6,000 women there. She tried our product and said, you need to be on QVC. She told the buyer, we got one shot. We got our first big yes, but, but what it meant, and this is one of the greatest life lessons and business lessons I've ever learned as it pertains to trusting your gut and staying authentic to who you are. We got one shot on QVC and here's what it meant. We got a 10 minute window to go live in front of hundred million homes and sell our product. But what it also meant was, and at the time we were selling only two to three orders a day on our website, right? Fulfilling them out of our living room, driving to the post office. Uh, so we're only selling two to three orders a day, barely staying alive. We had to, they ordered over 6,000 units of our concealer to sell in just a 10 minute window in order to hit their sales goal or not come back. And it was a consignment deal, which meant we weren't paid for any of it. And whatever sold, we got paid for, but whatever didn't sell would get shipped back to us. So it's like never, as an entrepreneur, never accept a purchase order you can't afford to lose. But at this point, we were like out of options. And it just felt like, you know what, let's just go all in. So we said yes. We applied for SBA loans, and I think the first 22 banks said no. Bank number 23 gave us an SBA loan to cover just the manufacturing costs of those 6,000 units. And so literally everything was on the line. I flew out to QVC a week early. And you know how a lot of times athletes will envision themselves on the podium or landing the triple axle or scoring the touchdown. Like you have, you visualize stuff. I flew out there a week early and I sat in this rental car in the parking lot of QVC, which is in Pennsylvania. And I just started envisioning everything. Like I was trying to pretend I was an athlete. And I was like visualizing everything I could, like the sold out sign coming up across the screen. And here's the moment that became hard. We hired third party consultants that are amazing at helping people succeed selling on television. And uh, they all told me the same thing. They said, if you're going to have any shot at success, you need to use this type of model, which was the same type of model I'd seen in magazines my whole life. Uh, you need to do yourself this way. And I would argue with them. I'd say, okay, but that's not why I created the product. And also like, what if I just like take my makeup off and show my bright red rosacea on national TV so I can prove live the product works. And like, I would say like, oh my gosh, if I'm sitting at home and I am 70 years old or I have hyperpigmentation or, or this skin challenge or this skin tone or this skin problem, if I don't see someone that looks like me, how do I know it's going to work for me? And like, we would argue and they wanted us to win. They wanted the best for us. And like, listen, this is what you, this is the best advice we can give you. Here's what you need to do. And like, one thing I'll say is, had I realized that if you're ever going to do anything novel or new, or even it's an idea that's been done a million times, but it's your take on it, of course, experts aren't going to think it's going to work because subconsciously they only think things are going to work that they've already seen proven work. Right. And I didn't know that for a long time and they mean so well, but they're seeing it. But even though a lot of them are visionaries, they're only able to see what you're doing through their own lens of experience. And so anyways, 
long story short, I didn't have a chance to do it both ways. It was like everything was on the line. And it's really easy to say, oh, I'm going to stick with authenticity and my mission. But then when you're in a moment where everything's on the line and you know you might lose your entire company, it's really hard to just tune in and trust your gut, right? Put your own gut instinct on a pedestal instead of the expert's advice. And I sat in that car for a week and I stared at the front door of the QVC building. And I knew the next time I walked through those doors, I would either walk out bankrupt (laughs) or with like my whole life changed. And the more I prayed about it, I would sit there in that car, literally crying, trying to like, like God take this from me because it feels so heavy and just tell me what to do. And it came down to a couple of things. I imagined who my customer was and I would just kind of imagine who she is watching at home. And for some reason I kept imagining like a single mom in Nebraska folding laundry who had, who was like too busy to remember she mattered and remember she's beautiful and that she's enough. And I just remember this moment where I was like, you know what? I would rather, if she's gonna bless me with five seconds of her precious time, I would rather have her look up on her TV screen and see me showing real women who look like her, calling them beautiful and meaning it. Even if she buys nothing, I'd rather that happen than like me sell a ton of product and stand for nothing. And so it was like, I knew what I had to do, but it doesn't mean it's easy, right? And when the 10 minute clock started, we went live on the air. And by the way, John, when when, uh, you, you probably know this, I didn't know this until I got there. When the 10 minute clock starts, you don't just get 10 minutes for sure. If you're a minute or two in and you're not selling enough, your clock cuts and it jumps down to two minutes and you just like lost six minutes. And it's the most stressful thing and most high pressure thing, right? Cause they don't mess around. Like you hit sales goals or, or, or that's it, which is any business. But so the 10 minute clock goes up. It's like 959, 958. I, Jamie, I, I got to stop you there for a second. Yeah, I, wa- I yeah. want people to realize this, like your future depends on this moment. Like I'm thinking about this. Do you think intuition is grossly misunderstood and underrated? I think it's misunderstood because I think that we have so much noise around us. I believe Gary, like every person listening, whether they're 12 years old or 112 years old, I think, I think we all have intuition, like a knowing inside of us. And I think our knowing's always right. I think our knowing is more. I'm I'm sorry, finish. No, no, I was going to say, I think our knowing is more powerful even than anyone else's advice but I think that we have so much noise around us from other people's opinions to our own oh, self-doubt, right? That it gets so loud, we start to not even be able to hear our own intuition anymore. So most people haven't even heard their own intuition in a long time or they don't know how. I would tell you that I couldn't applaud that POV more. It is my belief that my happiness, which matters to me the most, and then comma, my success, which I have pride in my professional life, is. predicated on my inability to compromise my intuition. I believe intuition is uncomfortably misunderstood. I believe that A students and very narrow uh, kind of rigid thinkers, which most people are, have demonized intuition. Mm. I think intuition is looked upon as careless and is positioned as silly or flaky or whatever else you wanna call it. And I will tell you that it is basically something that I've started exploring with myself and I believe it is a category of information that I will talk a lot more about because basically everything good that I've decided that has gone on to be very, very good has been far more based on intuition than anything else. I, you know, I have the exact same experiences, like, like how I broke through this crazy crowded beauty space and and built something that ended up passing all of the the companies I used to save my tip money as a Denny's waitress to buy in department stores was literally figuring out how to hear my own intuition and then trust it. That's the other part of it. Right. And like, I love that you're talking about this. And by the way, for so many people, that's how they hear God or their faith, whatever faith they practice, right? right. Or, or even the universe, they hear it through their own intuition. And um, I think it's like, I think it's your superpower. That's what I think. Um, I think that it's literally the one thing that changes everything that 
if I were an entrepreneur or even just someone that wanted to go after a dream or, I mean, that's the biggest thing I would focus on is how do I tune into and hear my own gut and how do I differentiate that from all the ways around me or other people? What, 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 what is your intuition? <laughs> it's funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do say that a lot, I, I just realized. What is your intuition on the other ingredient needed for this to actually work, which is the ability to be comfortable with failure? Because I'll tell you the reason I'm in love with my intuition is a couple of reasons. One, humility. My intuition has been the driver of so much success. It has also led to many failures. Mm -hmm. It is my capacity to be comfortable in my micro failure that has allowed me to continuously trust my intuition. Thoughts? Yeah. Thoughts are, okay, I'm going to say something you might freak out over or disagree with. I'm really excited. I think, <laughs> I think every time your intuition leads you to a failure, I don't think it's a failure. I think it's part of your 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 uh, destiny and your destined and your serendipitous journey where you had to build that muscle so in can order I, to so carry can, the so weight can I, of so your success. So can I stop you? Because I don't yes. think that's crazy at all. I actually, it makes me want to ask you something else. Do you believe that your optimism in your blood and soul is also a required ingredient to make what we're talking about here work. Because what I'm thinking about is the people on the other side, right? And now we're, they're listening to two successful people talking about intuition and they're basically saying, fuck these two. Like, okay, good. But like, you guys got lucky. And I know that I know a million people that have quote unquote got lucky in different levels of success financially, um, but have happiness of their journey but it is ingredients, it's a, it's a concoction. It is not a straight like, it's kind of like diseases, right? It's never like, oh, pepper. No, it's like, for example, with COVID, I hear like it's this thing and then the zinc can get in. It's mixtures, right? HIV, right? It was a cocktail. I'm listening carefully to you. We went intuition. Now what I wanna know, we, then we went with capacity to be comfortable with failure, AKA humility. Now I'm asking you because your answer is like, no, no, Gary, let me send you a different way. And I'm with you on this. I I view them as micro failures, but to your point, life is so serendipitous, you just don't know. Can you explain who you dedicated the book to and and why? Yes. So, you know, the book opening, here's what I've learned is whether it's in our leadership or our business or our relationships, so often our our self-worth is our ceiling. Um, to all of it. And yeah, the statistics are staggering. So I dedicate this book uh, to the 80% of women who do not believe they're enough, uh, 73% of men who feel inadequate or not enough, uh, the 91% of girls and women who don't love their body, the 75% of female executives who deal with imposter syndrome. And, you know, I I talk about in the dedication how when we believe we are not enough as as who we are um, and uh, that underneath it all, there's a lot of lies that we have to unlearn that lead to self-doubt. And the book is all about how to build self-worth and how you know, how that impacts in so many ways, your leadership, um, your uh, uh, business, your goals, your dreams, uh, because so often when it comes to any of the things we want in life, we don't become what we want. We become what we believe we're worthy of. And that for a lot of people is such a huge revelation because, um, and, you know, I go deep into, you know, the difference between self-worth and self-confidence and how they're very different, but you need both. And, uh, and one without the other can bring a lot of achievement, but not a lot of fulfillment. And so, yeah, this is, you know, for me, it's the the best work of my life, right? A lot of people mm. think like, oh, wow, you built a business in your living room and built it, you know, you were a Denny's waitress and you built a billion dollar business. And there's a lot of things that almost didn't happen because I didn't think I was worthy of them. And when I really try to look at the tools and the skill sets of, you know, how did I do that? How do I continue to, 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 to stop being tempted to doubt myself out of my own destiny. (laughs) And a lot of it is these tools. Um, 
and frameworks and things that I've applied in my life to believe I'm worthy of those things and worthy of being in a CEO role, worthy of leading a team, you know, all of that, whether, because we can be crushing it on the outside and have everything look so good to everyone else. But when internally we feel inadequate or not enough, it can truly impact our decision-making. It can impact how we handle challenges. It can impact how we lead a team. It can impact our own relationships. So, you know, self-worth, when I say self-worth is your ceiling, um, you know, self-worth is is truly in so many ways, the one thing that can change everything. And there's a whole, I won't get ahead of the conversation, but, you know, so much of my self-worth I get from my faith. And I feel like that is one of the greatest shortcuts. Um, But a lot of people, you know, are really, are really proud of how strong their faith is. um, And yet they still feel inadequate all of the time. Ladies and gentlemen, rock this house and welcome to the stage, Jamie Kern Lima! Jamie Kern Lima! Every single one of us has had someone tell us we're not enough. Every single one of us has had someone say words to us that hurt. 